So it is my pleasure to introduce a good friend, Andrea Brighenti. Andrea and I met early on in the transatlantic journey I've been sketching in my introductions, and the context of our encounter already made clear we had a number of interests in common. It was at a conference at the University of Cambridge devoted to that strange and marginalized topic of hypnosis and contagion and suggestions that were central to 19th century psychology, were somehow forgotten in the last century, and are now back on the theoretical scene, contributing to the return of attention to mimesis in the present century. My, mimesis was actually staged at that conference for the two keynote speakers, Bruno Latour and Bruno Carsenti, uh, restaged the famous 1903 debate between Durkheim and Tard, with Latour on the side of Tard. Andrea and I went for a dinner, and after that, we have kept in touch since, joining forces to promote a return of attention to the powers of imitation. So Andrea Brighenti is professor of social theory in the Department of Sociology at the University of Trento in Italy. His work focuses on the intersection of space, power, and society with a strong interest in theories of crowds and masses that have for a long time remained at the margins of sociology, but are central to what Gilles Deleuze calls micro-imitations. Among his books, I mentioned Visibility in Social Theory and Social Research, The Ambiguous Multiplicities, Materials Episteme, and Political Cluttered Social Formations. And more recently, he co-authored with the Swedish architect Matthias Kerholm, Animated Lands, Studies in Territoriology. Andrea just completed a book-length manuscript on, this, on the social theory of Canetti, which is probably linked to his talk today, titled Imitation, Metamorphosis, Becoming a Comparative Social Theoretical Sketch. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nidesh. It's really a pleasure to be, to be with you and uh, as always to catch up this uh, endless <laughs> conversation that we're having. And perhaps next time in person it will be even more beautiful, but uh, for the time being, let's, let's uh, follow this format. Um, so um, I would like, um, uh, if I may, uh, to just do something a little bit different from what I usually do in my talks, which are usually more, let's say, uh, based on the inspiration of the instant, let's say, and to do something a little bit more, if I may say so, scholastic, uh, read also boring if you want. But at some point I really felt the need to sort of go back to the basics and so I went back to these three authors, um, which I've been hanging out for quite a while <laughs> with, and um, perhaps they've been already discussed these days, probably they've been already discussed these days, but as I told you, it's difficult to, to, to follow a whole uh, conference online, and there are these local commitments that usually uh, bring us uh, you know, back to, to, to the reality. As uh, Nidesh said, we only have one body, and maybe only one soul also. <laughs> so, so I try to save my soul by just uh, uh, talking a little bit about these three notions that I associate quite strongly with these three authors. So I, it's kind of really uh, uh, going back to, to, to what, what is the message that comes out from these uh, three authors uh, as I really uh, read them. And I would say I've spent a lot of time with these three authors um, but uh, I'm not a specialist in any of them, so so I'm not a philologist, and you know there are probably many weak uh, sides or weak spots in which um, um, uh, this this sort of approach can be can be criticized, and I'm you know absolutely open to all sort of. Uh, so the three authors I'm considering are Gabriel Tard, which has been mentioned, and Elias Canetti, and uh, Gilles Deleuze. Uh, okay, someone one day, someone said to me, but they're all white, male, <laughs> bourgeois <laughs> figures. Yes, they are. But, uh, you know, at least uh, they are dead. I think <laughs> it goes to their merit. <laughs> it goes to their merit that, you know, they rest in peace and, you know, we can sort of use these authors, especially because they were not, I mean, even Deleuze who was probably the most uh, systematic, they are not so systematic after all. So there are still, you know, some, some, um, some something incomplete about them that, uh, that, it, that is interesting to, to explore. So uh, just give you a little bit of 
historical context, of course, Tard was uh, active in the 1890s, the 1890s, and is famously associated with this idea that social life is essentially imitative in nature. And uh, uh, although imitation does not exhaust uh, the whole of his theory, uh, you know, it is amply, let's say, elaborated about uh, throughout his work. Then if we move to Canetti and, and then Deleuze, okay, Canetti was, uh, let's say, active in the 1950s, so in a very different, from the 30s to the 50s, and then he had a very long life. So, but uh, insofar as we are concerned, the book that we're looking at in particular is Crowds and Power, which was published in 1960, with a very, very long elaboration of life, through his life, but uh, most of what he writes is really influenced by that 1950s very deep, very tough, I would say, attitude, very tough times. He lived through the Second World War and he was a refugee in, to London and so. And uh, Deleuze was active, let's say, a kind of 20 years later, so in the 60s and 70s, particularly his work with uh, Felix Watery was completed, let's say, in the 1980, I would say, with Mi Plateau, and then, of course, what is philosophy in the, in, in the early 90s, but essentially uh, his reflection that we are concerned with, um, this notion of becoming is really uh, engineered, I would say, it's really crafted during the, the 60s. So they all seem to have been working with some sort of mimetic-like notion, uh, and, and in, in various ways, according to, I would say, perhaps, different also sort of research questions. So, so, what, so what I'm trying to do now is to find out a little bit, to unearth a little bit, what is the, the research question here? And uh, uh, what is the, the, the idea, the, the, the insight, I would say, that uh, we can get, gain from these uh, uh, people, let's say. So Tard's fame, ironically, as, as Dinda says, was quite uh, tardive, I would say, <laughs> to play with the word omen, nomen, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, for many years, it was like uh, uh, summarized in this, in this idea and in this debate that uh, allegedly lost against the younger uh, Durkheim. Durkheim was like 17, year, 17 years younger than, than Tard at the time of that famous uh, 1903 debate. Uh, the idea that uh, the social being as such is um, uh, an imitator par excellence, an, uh, an imitator by, by, par excellence, let's say. And uh, it's interesting that if you think about it, even today, when in, in social psychology, when they, when they do very, even very technical experiments that they, that they do, uh, the, the adjective social really means social effects, social whatever, really is a synonym of uh, imitative, of, 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 of imitative behavior. Social effects are imitative effects in, in this context, which somehow proves the long lasting, at, I think, impact of uh, Tard in this, uh, in this context. So for Tard, the imitation is a kind of uh, one example of a more general phenomenon called repetition. And it is the, 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 the the social dimension of repetition, just like we'd say inheritance is for him biological repetition and and uh, and wave wave like phenomena are physical repetitions. So you can get a sense that he was really trying to work through this sort of uh, 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 parallel parallel parallelism across different domains. But what is really specific of the social limitation for Tard? are two aspects. One is the, first, the, the thing that um, it's a, a social repetition is a kind of amplified repetition vis-a-vis -vis the physical repetition that needs to go through all the, the intermediate, let's say, processes. The inter, the, 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 it has to cross, uh, cut across, to walk across, to, 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 to diffuse itself across um, all the, the particles or the, the matter that, that is in between, um, social repetition has this advantage of existing um, at a distance, so to speak. So, so, so being amplified and, and also being sort of uh, sped up, speeded up, sort of. It's a kind of uh, um, uh, 
um, enhancing of uh, maybe intensification of, uh, of, the, of the biological and the, the physical uh, basic phenomenon of repetition. So there is this idea that perhaps comes, is, can also be seen very powerfully in, in Georg Zimmel's work of Steigerung, of intensification, really, that, that social life is, has to do with this intensity in some way or the other. And then, of course, there is a famous metaphor of the sleepwalker that says that uh, society is imitation, imitation, a kind of somnambulism. This idea that you sleep and you walk, you you act, you do something, but in a state of conscience that there is some sort of uh, imagination or dream that social life is a kind of dream, a dream, dream experience that that we don't do exactly, we don't know exactly what it is. We experience it as, as if in a kind of hypnotic way. I always use the, with the students this image of um, someone who's taking a, um, a metro, a, met, a, a tube ride, uh, right on the tube or on the metro, and you know, the, you, you are entering this sort of soft stage, and you know, when the stop comes, you sort of wake up and you, you know, you don't know where you are in many cases, and you're a check. Par paranoically the, the train, the stop where you, where you have to get out because, you know, it's a kind of strange situation like, like this. So, um, so uh, for TARD, basically a society is nothing but the historical and contingent organization of this basic phenomenon of imi imitativeness, let's say. Uh, TARD was like, a, it would seem like to be I would I call it you know a kind of uh, a pluralist who harbors a kind of monist dream at heart because he has this idea that whatever is social must pass through this imitation. But interestingly, imitation does not lead to increased similarity because this is the paradox, of course. Because if if there were if there were just one mechanism of social life, then in the long run it should necessarily lead to uh, homogeneous or fully assimilated in, in sociological lexicon society, which is not the case. For Tard, uh, the, the plurality, the heterogeneity is, as he says, at the heart of things. So, so we always start with this heterogeneity, and the operation of imitation works on this heterogeneity by creating uh, by creating something, by creating some, some currents, by, by creating some rivers, as it also says, um, by creating some expansion. So there is this, uh, dr this, this dream of expansion, of con conquering larger territories. So each imitation, each imitative chain, the imitation works along this chain, want, wants to diffuse itself. The, the social thing is, um, is um, uh, expansive by nature. La chose sociale tend à s'étendre, à s'étendre. So this, this uh, extensive operational thing, this ambition of the social thing mm, to, to become larger, to become bigger. Society begins small and becomes larger, becomes always bigger and bigger. And of course, because Tard was a very positive thinker, he was very, yeah, the, he held this, this belief that by becoming bigger, society also become more peaceful, which is, uh, of course, uh, something we're not so so certain about nowadays. But uh, that was his dream that society would become global, and by becoming global, it would become peaceful. Mm -hmm. So this idea of imitation um, becomes sim begins simple, becomes as this kind of interpsychic very simple interpsychic action, but it, it, it carries with it the, the, the promise of a, of a very strong, I would say, morphogenetic uh, potential that, that by, by in, in, in intersecting all these small limitations or the small limitation of rivers, the, the rivulets, let's say, the small imita imitative uh, things that uh, a, a kind of social structures come to, comes into existence. Mm -hmm. That is why, of course, there is not only one, I would say, um, notion that is basic to, to Tard, but at least three. And I would say, of course, there is this idea of uh, imitation, but that, that also goes with two other ideas. And the second very powerful idea in Tard is invention, what he calls invention, which is, which is what happens when 
two different imitations intersect in, and they meet and clash into one's brain in a way. So the brain is this receptive organ where different imitational flows, different imitational rivers uh, join and they click into the, someone's mind and something a, bit, a little bit unsocial happens because it says the, the, the inventor is always someone who has to somehow uh, take a step back from, from the social game, from, from social life, go in a strange place and um, create this synthesis of different imitations and come back and give back this new thing, this invention. Because at the end of the day, an imitation is always the imitation of an invention. What do you imitate if not something that originally? So Tarn sociology is the sociology of the, what he calls also the invisible originalities. Society begins small and becomes large. Social science should go back from the large social ensembles to the smaller, invisible, tiny origins of, of this invention, which are not always massive, impressive invention, but just a small, maybe a small variation in the, in the, um, in the repetitional uh, game. So we have, invent we have uh, repetition, we have invention, and third, we have this third very crucial element, which is um, mm, what uh, Tard calls opposition, but it, it's a strange word. It, it probably didn't pick the best word for to illustrate what it, but I would call doubt. You know, when, when you as an individual are between two different um, models, two different possible imitations, and you are uncertain, what is my, you know, where do, where do I turn to? What, what is the, the influential model? What is the prestigious one? Which I will, where does my desire go? Which, which uh, direction? So the whole architecture is important to, to remember, you know, that to, to remind ourselves that basically imitation does not lead to a situation where we are like formatted, but to a very dynamic situation in which we constantly rearrange ourselves, our preferences, our, so all these metaphors of liquid, so Sigmund Baumar is famous for these liquid metaphors, but they really come from Tart, this idea that society is, is a wet, is a liquid uh, environment where uh, all, this, all, these things, um, all these things happen. So the, the, the way, in a way, uh, imitation work is, is revealed in a way as, as inherently transformative of realities rather than simply replicative or, or, or replica-like. It is true that in the second, uh, uh, in the preface to the second edition of uh, the Le de l'Imitation, the, 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 the Laws and of Imitation, which is this classic book by 1819, but the second edition is very famous for introducing this metaphor, which is a photographic metaphor, the metaphor uh, which later recurs also in Bergson, for instance, Bergson also took the same chair that uh, uh, tired, uh, vacated by, by dying <laughs> at the Collège de France. And uh, uh, interestingly, there he speaks of uh, this, this idea of uh, imprint, of uh, imprint, mm -hmm. uh, photo phot photographical imprint, which is interesting because by the time he was writing, photography was still a relatively new technique. So I could only, could only dream what uh, Tard would have picked today as a kind of, it sounds as a crude mechanistic metaphor read right today, but back in the days, you know, it was very, very, you know, cutting edge as a bit, you know, perhaps today we would speak of algorithms of artificial intelligence or something like that, that society is a kind of artificial intelligence, I don't know. But certainly this idea of the photographic cliche is, uh, is, is, a, very, is a very powerful idea of this, uh, transliteration at a distance, this ac action, Dini speaks a lot of action at a distance, action at a distance in, through a specific medium. So the medium here, in the case of photography, the medium is light. In the case of social life, what is the medium? This very, becomes very difficult to, to say because Tard was also famous for having very bad experience with, with establishing this, this discipline, which, which failed to establish this kind of interpsychology, which is the, we have precisely this, this idea of uh, uh, the, it's attempted to capture this kind of pulviscular, this, this uh, microscopic, this, this undulatory uh, medium, 
of the social of the social itself. Mm -hmm. But the idea of imprint, I think, is is also interesting because it speaks of something which is not so much visual. I would I would say, perhaps with with Paris, we could say it's not it's not iconic as much as it is indexical. There's this idea of imprinting the material. It's really uh, where where Peirce spe specifically sp speaks of the index as a, really the index the pointed finger that really makes makes uh, makes you turn your your gaze towards something. So, so there is this very powerful um, idea, and of course the character that is imprinted is also the char the personal character. So there is all this characteriology, the uh, the, the, um, the action of uh, caracting of imprinting something is very interesting. Let's turn to Canetti very quickly through this kind of um, very uh, sketchy reconstruction that, that I'm trying. And the notion that Canetti employs and is the notion of uh, Verwandlung, of transformation. It is a very uh, powerful notion. Also recalling that Canetti was not a theorist. He himself said, I'm not a theorist. He always wrote and thought as a kind of dramatist, as kind of dramatical um, way of, uh, of imagining uh, society and the social experience. Like Tard, I would say Canetti is a very, I, I, I place them in this category of the continuist thinkers, the thinkers by continuity. The idea that transformation are continuous and uh, that, that there is no clear cut as, as, as opposed most clearly to Durkheimian sociology where between the individual and society, there is a gap, there is a, there is a huge discontinuity, right? The, the, the individual would never be able to create society by himself or herself. Um, whereas uh, both uh, Tard and Canetti have this idea um, that, uh, that there is this, um, this uh, continuous kind of work, that metamorphosis or transformation is a kind of continuous ongoing effort. Um, it, it's paradoxical again, because Canetti has been often criticized or charged for being a a, a cold-blooded realist or kind of high a historical kind of thinker that, uh, but I think that most of these critiques uh, really miss the mark uh, in, in this idea of uh, a transformation that, uh, that of course is, uh, is different from a kind of hist historiographical take on, on social life, but uh, still it's, it's very dynamic and very imbued with ambiguity. Nidish in the first day was, was talking uh, was presenting the basic the fundamental ambiguities of, of imitation. And here we have something like this, very similar. On the one hand, for Canetti, uh, imitation is, uh, uh, transformation is a, is a tool of resistance. It's a, it's a kind of tool of resistance against power, which for Canetti is a, is a, is a, is a negative, uh, is the negative experience, uh, it's the worst experience humans can have in a way. And power it always preoccupied with fixating shapes, fixating forms, capturing individuals, uh, um, um, uh, like in a kind of straight jacket, even a kind of mental, the, the, the powerful man for Kenneth is always a mentally ill person because it's obsessed and it can change. It has lost the ability to, to transform himself or uh, herself. So, so, uh, so much so that in his famous uh, talk, uh, um, the 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 dichter as uh, he says uh, the, the the writer the writer the poet the intellectual the, is must be the protector of the, the the keeper of these transformations that that are the most precious things that humans have and the, the, the writer is 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 completely committed to save all this transformation and to to say to to rescue this this, this transformational these stories of these transformations and and put and, and, and put them into into his or her uh, work. So uh, so resistance seems to be cast against power, but at the same time, the ambivalence here is that Canetti himself says that resist the, the humans are the most uh, the most transformative, the most metamorphic beings, and by be, by this this gift of transformation is what has given them so much power on the rest of, uh, of the animals. And that's the catastrophe of our incapacity to, to be with the animals in a, in a peaceful, in a, in, a, in, a, in a natural kind of way, 
uh, our difficulty with, with, with dealing with animals um, very much derives from, from our uh, from this kind of ruse, from this kind of uh, uh, cunning transformation that we have put into uh, into play. The, the the hunter, not not the hunter, but the hunter in this case is the, is the figure of this uh, uh, very cunning way of of uh, tracking and and um, and uh, having the animal fall into one's um, one's trap in a way. So. Uh, uh, as, as concerned Deleuze, just to complete my, my gallery, I say, okay, Deleuze wanted, as we know, to, he, he harbored this, this idea of, of, uh, of uh, was great professor, Deleuze uh, adapted about it, his courses, uh, you can hear his uh, voice um, um, in his courses, and um, each course was unique and, and passionate in its way. He wanted to to have a, to to give a course on TARD, but he eventually never did it and never managed to do so. Uh, there is a, a, a footnote in um, a difference in repetition, this uh, book from '68, um, where he, there is this, this declaration of love for for TARD, and it's not a very long footnote, but uh, he, he seems to enlist TARD in this kind of uh, uh, theoretical ally in this. Uh, uh, anti-Platonicism that he wants to uh, to develop, and the, the idea for Deleuze, uh, in, of course, is that there is no uh, external original uh, to copy or reproduce. So, so we do not have that original. Which, I mean, it would be interesting. It would have been very fascinating to 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 see how Deleuze would have dealt with the with the with the photographic cliche metaphor in in Tard, but uh, we don't have that part. And uh, as concerned the, 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 the monist or pluralist, I would say Deleuze was, uh, was a, as he said himself, was a metaphysician through and through. So he always wrote as a kind of uh, monist, I would say. But also his philosophy is all about reconciling monism and uh, pluralism. At some point in Milpato, there is this strange, um, uh, formula, monism equal, equal pluralism. So how to reconcile this apparently completely uh, opposite views of... Um, uh, I would say that in opposition to Canetti, who was a very visionary, I would say, very visionary writer uh, with, uh, with the strong images coming from anthropology, uh, from ethnology, uh, regardless of the fact that we were uh, accurate from uh, an anthropological point of view, but very stunning um, images that Canetti was able to, to, to choose. Uh, Deleuze was certainly kind of pure theorist. In most of what he writes is, um, is, is, is very theoretical and very hard to get at in many cases. And even in what he's, uh, is, he reads simple as in what his philosophy is, is a very deceptive kind of simplicity Kind of simplicity that you reach when you're old, and and uh, and uh, it, it implies so much that it. Um, but of course, I would say it's not wrong to say that Deleuze was a visionary in, in himself, in a way, the in the sense that he always had this preoccupation with style. I mean, the style is this medium, in a way, of, of philosophy. And the stylistics of Deleuze is very pe peculiar. Also, it's very geometrical construction of sentences, uh, uh, the choice of the three instead of, and then instead of the two, and then the two by two in in um, the two by two matrix in um, in um, respectively in uh, Antidipus and uh, Mid Plateau. Uh, of course, there is this uh, plateau in uh, this plateau, this chapter in Mid Plateau. Which is titled uh, "Devenir intense, devenir animal, devenir imperceptible," which is probably the place where we would like to to go now. As, but there is a little quip with the translation where "devenir" is a word that uh, derives from Italian "divenir," and it's a, it's not an ancient word actually. No, it's not an ancient verb. Uh, it is it, it dates from the from the lower Middle Ages. So. The Latin, the Latin uh, verb is uh, is uh, uh, fio, uh, fio, uh, fieri, to be made, which is kind of lost uh, to to usage. So, if you look at Dante, for instance, Dante uses uh, uh, divenire as a very physical 
uh, a physical uh, action. It is the action of literally going down. So the veneer is going to the going walking to the bottom of uh, of a of a mountain. So this D D D, D is uh, um, is really the same prefix that you have in desire. The, 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 see there are the, something that comes down from the stars, right? So it comes down. There is this idea of coming down, of really which is very different from the verb uh, becoming in English because becoming really means come to be. And so it is it really, there's a, con there's a tension, a contradiction uh, that seems to, becoming seems to betray really the meaning that, that Deleuze try is trying to construct here. So, so which is not the opposite of the thing that comes to, it, to be in a determinate state, right? So the, the account of becoming really misses completely the, the notion of in-between that Deleuze is trying to... And also, if you look at Devenir Animal, for instance, I would like to speak a little bit just that, about Devenir Animal, the first, the, the second the second form they, they consider, uh, Deleuze and Guattari, they consider. Devenir Animal uh, is, is rendered in translation as becoming animal, but this is again, uh, kind of betrays the idea because it seems like one becomes an animal and the animal already exists, which is, you know, it's. The, the, the idea of devenir is exactly the opposite. It's the idea that uh, the entity does not pre-exist to the, to the devenir. So, so at least, at the very least, we should say animal becoming, not becoming animal, because the animal is the quality of the becoming. It's not something, it's not the object that one becomes. It's really a quality of the, of the, of the verb itself. And also, perhaps to remark this point, I would say, I would kind of introduce this, if you allow me, introduce this neologism. So I would say a de-coming, right? So it, just to remark the fact that it's not a coming to be. And, and so we could speak of, if you allow me, animal de-coming as this kind of uh, transformational enterprise of the, of the devenir animal. And this animal de-coming is really in the terms of Simon Don, who was a philosopher close to Deleuze, or better Deleuze was close to Simon Don, I would say, uh, is an allagmatic verb. So it's an operational. The allagmatic is the science of the transformation. So, so the transformation where, as uh, Deleuze says, n'y a pas de terme. I mean, there's no uh, object that. Uh, it is, a, it is a process philosophy, and the, the, the difficulty of a process philosophy is, of course, that we are an object-oriented, uh, we are an object-oriented uh, society in a way. So it's very difficult to, to visualize this, this, this uh, animal, is, uh, this animal becoming. There are some bodily expressions of this. I would like to just uh, open a parenthesis here, a static kind of parenthesis. I don't know if you see in the Abyssin there. Uh, which is this uh, interview that uh, there was, uh, gave to uh, under the condition that it would only have been used after his death. And um, in the Abyssin there, you can clearly see that the old Deleuze in the 60s has these very long nails, like, like, like a vampire. This, these long nails, I, I always wonder what are these nails? You know, what is the story that they, what is this animal becoming of the last nails, and what did they say? And uh, you know, <laughs> if you allow me something more personal, you know, what is a dreadlock? I mean, this strange thing. It's it's um, it is not it is not really uh, an animal. It's not it does not it is not the shape of an animal. It's not a form. But there is this idea of um, that speaks of this uh, zone of indistinction where where two different entities that seems to exist establish a kind of uh, um, a kind of um, neighborhood a kind of a kind of similarity a kind of um, which is something they say different from both a series and so there is this serialist transformation the the linear metamorphosis in Canetti for instance and uh, uh, something also different from uh, a structure. Mm -hmm. the, the, of course, Deleuze and, uh, and Guattari were interested in the in the in Levi Strauss and all the, the structuralist uh, um, kind of uh, philosophy, but they tried to also dissociate themselves from that 
kind of uh, way of thinking, there's a very interesting, very funny sentence where they say that with thanks to structuralism, the world becomes more reasonable. <laughs> it's, a, it's, of course, a very ironic kind of statement, but they want to stress this fact that Whereas if you want the, the series, the serialist transformation, which we could also associate somehow with Jung, with this idea of the, of the, um, of the symbols of, of libido in Jung, but it, something is, is constantly flowing and A is similar to B, B is similar to C, and there's this slippage of forms uh, in a way. Uh, structuralism is established the proportions, mm -hmm. A is to B, what C is to D. So it establishes this, this sort of very, um, analytical, it's a kind of different layer of reality, this kind of analytical thing. So the decoming, the animal decoming that uh, that Deleuze and Guattari are after is a kind of uh, way of uh, moving between, if you want, this, the, 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 the serialist, uh, the serialist kind of thinking and, and, um, and this the structuralist kind of uh, kind of thinking. And one thing here is, of course, that there is this strong vitalist uh, heritage to, 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 to Deleuze and Deleuze says everything I did, uh, everything I hope, I, ho I hope that everything I did uh, was uh, vitalist at the very end of his life. Uh, the, 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 the decoming Deleuze is talking about is as this very strong characteristics of as asymmetry, it, it is asymmetrical. That is why every, every vitalist is necessarily a, an asymmetrist, that, because there cannot be any symmetry between life and death, of course. And that is why I believe they only they say that the only decoming, the only decoming is, is, is a kind of minority uh, decoming. There is no majority decoming there, because the majority, in a way, is is already there in a way. It's, it doesn't need to to become. It doesn't need to 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 to. Um, uh, they speak of the empty sample, for instance. What is an empty sample? This kind of sample that that is already everybody and nobody. Everybody and nobody. And uh, that's why, if you want, the 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 operation of decoming is is always by subtraction by taking something out of the n minus one, n minus one, which could also be read in this very um, known, math strange mathematical way, but maybe there is a way to make it mathematical. I don't know, it would be very interesting to work with mathematicians on this. Uh, I read it as n minus one, I read it as everything but uh, one, everything but unit, mm -hmm. everything you want, but it's not unit, it's not. Is not the one. It's not this this uh, this one operation. So, so this this subtraction that I'm speaking about, of course, could also be interpreted in the terms of the deterritorialization, the deterritorialization that um, uh, implies that one has to leave uh, a home territory, a home range. You have to you have to go out of your comfort zone. That you have to to extract yourself from from your from your habits, from from your so so this is uh, why does this happen? It happens for many reasons, but essentially for desire. I mean, for this kind of seduction, for this kind of uh, seductive way. Uh, the whole of the the Lose, Lozian philosophy is also a, a philosophy of perversion. It's interested in masochism, for instance. Uh, test this. Uh, it is this this idea that you are. Uh, you are abroad, and the, the leer, of course, the, the leer literally means going out of the bluff, right? So uh, <laughs> getting off track, you know, off records. It's a complete, you know, out of character, if you want, out of character kind of behavior, right? So what is this bird who at some point, you know, there are these birds that, you know, they place, a, they place their eggs into someone, else, someone else's nest. So their 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 bird their, their egg are very similar to so what is this mimicry thing you know are very similar to to the and the the the, the bird that eventually uh, um, uh, keeps the eat and and then covets these 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 little eggs that kind of make the distinction between his her, her own original eggs and the and the and this this part. But the first act, you have to imagine the first bird who imitated this. How did this happen? It's completely strange that a bird should make a, 
an egg that is not a species egg, but someone else's. Um, you know, so how it, it requires a whole theory of, of semblances and and again this, this zone of indistinction. How is it that we come to 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 be so similar to someone else we are not? You know, you know, it's it's a it's a very strange uh, experience. But uh, and just to conclude, of course, because I'm running short of time, uh, the last last book project uh, uh, was never finished. It was supposed to be called uh, Ensemble et Multiplicité. Et Ensemble et Multiplicité was, was a kind of, the uh, Deleuze is famous for the end, as far as this uh, additive end that you can always add something more, that you can always compose something more. But this it, this it is different. Uh, and of course, he wanted to juxtapose the ensemble, the, the set, set theory in mathematics and the, what he calls the multiplicity or mm, the manifolds in mathematics. So this, this clearly this idea that, uh, that, uh, that a manifold, that a becoming process, the process of becoming cannot be reduced to a set, that cannot be reduced to a collection of uh, elements, That's, but must be seen in the light of this uh, operation and this operation is an operation again, I would say we, here we go back to TARD perhaps, uh, an operation of intensification, of, of, of working by intensity, by, by intention. And just quote Deleuze here, where it says, in multiplicity, it's defined defini not par les éléments qui la composent en extension, ni pas par les caractères qui la composent en compréhension, mais par les lignes. Et les dimensions qu'elle comporte en intention, hein? by the lines and by the dimensions. So, what are these dimensions of a, of a manifold? It's as if you know you could work on this on this strange um, this strange phenomenon, which is a society, for instance. In the case of social theory, I'm interested in what is a society. It's not a collection of individuals, but it's something more more complex. What what are these these lines and dimension that uh, imply, the law says, imply, imply this uh, uh, formation uh, in intensity, by intensity. Hmm? And here the role, for instance, of the, the what is the law calls the bordure, the, the, the phenomenon that happens on the border, that happens on the, on the, on the threshold. There are limit cases, the limit case, for instance, Moby Dick has a limit case of, of, uh, of a whale, uh, or, or, or the Danwich horror as a limit case of uh, of a creature in um, Lovecraft, definitely yes, the Danwich horror, yes, uh, yeah. So, well, I can stop here. I mean, um... thanks very much, Andrea.